2001 was a pivotal year for video games. The advent of the sixth generation consoles gave way for groundbreaking titles that pushed the boundaries of what video games were capable of. Halo paved new roads for console multiplayer shooters, Final Fantasy X showcased breathtaking visuals that took cinematic RPGs to the next level, Silent Hill 2 redefined horror with its provocative story and unsettling environments. With 2001's stellar lineup already hitting shelves, Capcom unleashed the bombshell hit that would change action games forever. Let's rock, baby. Devil May Cry revolutionized action games in a way that put its combat front and center. While most action games used to use their enemies as obstacles to be dispatched, Devil May Cry lets you toy with your enemies with free-flowing combos that turn combat into an art form. It's not enough to simply fight and win, Devil May Cry lets you be stylish. A big part of Devil May Cry's success lies in its protagonist, the legendary Devil Hunter Dante. The Devil May Cry series has firmly planted itself as one of Capcom's flagship titles, with Dante making cameo appearances in many, many games. So what is it about this white-haired devil hunter that is so beloved? As a brief aside, Devil May Cry has an interesting development history. When Capcom completed Resident Evil 2 in 1998, they were looking into developing a new Resident Evil for the upcoming PlayStation 2, a game that would eventually become Resident Evil 4. Hideki Kamiya was appointed as director of this project, under the code name Team Little Devil. Kamiya envisioned a Resident Evil game about stylish action a game where the protagonist was a nigh-invincible superhuman capable of utterly impossible combat feats. In development, this character's name was Tony Redgrave. Shinji Mikami, the Resident Evil series director, felt that direction strayed away from RE's roots as survival horror. After Kamiya's team took a trip to Europe to visit Spanish Gothic cathedrals and other rustic locations for inspiration, Kamiya was convinced to rewrite his game into a story about demons and Devil May Cry was born. This particular fact will be relevant later. Dante is the son of Sparta, a legendary Dark Knight who fought against the forces of the underworld to save humanity. As a devil hunter for hire, he follows in his father's footsteps, protecting mankind from the invasions of hell, one job at a time. That's about all you need to know before you dive into the long-term history, but it plays well into his design. He's a mercenary, a hitman, an exterminator, and he's always dressed to throw down with style and flair. One key to Dante's success and popularity is his signature look. Dante has had many looks throughout the years, but a few elements remain consistent. White hair, long red coat, black clothes, and a big sword. Dante's color palette has become so iconic that you can't even make a white-haired man in red and black without accidentally invoking his image. Hideki Kamiya once stated that he chose red as Dante's primary color because it's a hero's colors, but also to contrast his personality against Resident Evil 2 protagonist Leon Kennedy's RPG Blue. Dante's colors serve both a practical and a characterizing function. Dante is often exploring dark, foreboding environments, ancient castles, dead cities, and demonic towers. From a visibility standpoint, Dante's big red coat and shock of white hair make him very visible, so you always keep your eyes on him and don't miss even a second of stylish action. But it's also this sort of visibility that connects Dante to the player. There's a certain psychology to video games that bridges the experience between the player and the character on screen. In a Resident Evil game, you play as an isolated human with limited means of fighting back, exploring dangerous, hostile places crawling with monsters. The controls, the limited ammunition, and the environment work in tandem to create a sense of fear and vulnerability. If you had that exact same environment, except your character was a smart-mouthed jackass who was sarcastic, fearless, and overwhelmingly combat-capable, you feel a lot less vulnerable. The tonal contrast is jarring and it almost makes Dante feel out of place. But that's entirely the point. You have these dark, gothic-inspired places full of demons, and Dante is a brightly dressed modern man who just laughs in the face of danger. That brashness is empowering, 
it gives you, the player, the same kind of fearlessness that Dante showcases and it encourages you to play stylish and cool, the way Dante would. I also came upon a neat little historical tidbit while I was researching. It can't go unsaid that Devil May Cry very liberally borrows its inspiration from Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, from character namesakes like Dante and Virgil, as well as its focus on Hell and its ranks of demons. Out of curiosity, I googled up a picture of Mr. Alighieri, and it seems that most paintings depict him frequently wearing red robes and black garments. Not only is this color choice functional and representative of Dante's character, it's also a historical reference. Weird world we live in where this Dante looks more like his historical namesake than this Dante who's taking the Inferno thing a little too literally. I think it's also worth talking about Dante's weaponry. Swords and guns are definitely nothing new by 2001, and the combination of the two invokes a particularly 90s aesthetic. But what's important about Dante's weapons is how it illustrates his self-expression. While Dante's expanded arsenal is quite large, it splits neatly into two categories. Devil arms and guns. This distinction is important to me because they neatly draw the difference between Dante's lineage and Dante's own tastes. Devil arms are weapons from the underworld, most of which are formed from the essence of actual demons. As the son of Sparta, it's absolutely within his ability to conquer demons and wield their own powers as his own. On the other hand, guns are just guns. There are more demonic looking guns like the Nightmare Beta, Artemis, and Dr. Faust that are actually classified as devil arms. But the majority of guns Dante picks up are just regular guns. His signature pistols, Ebony and Ivory, are just customized Colt M1911 handguns, a standard sidearm of US Armed Forces. By comparison, these are very human weapons, and represent Dante's human heritage. The guns themselves aren't even especially powerful or effective against demon kind. Just look how long it takes for Ebony and Ivory to actually kill a demon. In other words, Dante doesn't even need the guns, he just uses them because he likes them. Guns give Dante a sense of self-expression, and even ordinary guns become deadly in his hands because of his flair and creativity. Among Dante's weapons, none are more central to him than his signature sword, Rebellion. Rebellion first appeared as Dante's starting sword in Devil May Cry 2, but didn't receive its signature look until Devil May Cry 3. In DMC1, he wields the Force Edge, which is very quickly swapped out for Alastor not long into the game. Rebellion, however, has become so directly associated with Dante himself that they will sometimes retroactively depict Dante with Rebellion instead of Force Edge. I've always felt that Rebellion's relevance to Dante is something more metaphorical. Dante embodies the idea of Rebellion in many ways, and it tends to take different forms throughout his life. Rebellion against his lineage, rebellion against his past, rebellion against a usurper, rebellion against an aberration of his father's legacy, rebellion against himself. But what is more direct and consistent is how Dante rebels against the setting. His opposition consists of ancient evils, resurrected demon gods, kings of hell who expect resistance from a legendary dark knight, and instead they get this idiot. Quipping, joking, bringing guns to sword fights, Dante's very presence is a rebellion against all demon kind. There's something interesting about how the character was developed over time. Although the series has a somewhat consistent timeline, the development between the game's numbered releases and its actual timeline creates an interesting chronology. If we count every mainline series, as well as the animation, TMC5 made it canon, the timeline is supposed to look like this. What this means is that Dante was developed a certain way in DMC 1 and 2, but his change in 3 retroactively adds new context to the events of 1 and 2, and then going forward from there. Allow me to illustrate. Dante started as a sort of calm, quiet, cool guy, but was later changed into a wild, wacky guy in DMC 3, after a bad feedback from his personality in 2. While it makes sense in development, it does something interesting to the timeline by changing his personality retroactively. While I can't say for sure if Dante's long-term development was ever intended to be this way, I do feel like it unintentionally creates a full narrative arc that lasts through Dante's entire life path. This is really more my personal interpretation, so don't take this as canon or anything. 
Starting at Devil May Cry 3, young teenage Dante is brash, reckless, and a big show-off. He loves partying, pizza, and being a cool guy. It's here where you see the most of Dante talking smack and laughing in the face of certain danger. But there's another aspect of Dante that's prevalent in 3 that becomes an important recurring theme in this game. Check out this character establishing moment from the very first scene in the game. Not that one. Not that one. Nope. This party's getting crazy. Let's rock. There. Right there. Dante is a dork. The game goes out of its way to show that Dante's too cool for school attitude doesn't always work out for him. His theatrics always either backfire on him or end up getting him in more trouble. Aside from the pure comedic value of this, it also happens to highlight Dante's central conflict in this game. He's irresponsible for himself and those around him, so much that he rejects his legacy as Sparta's successor and denies his own heritage. Why do you refuse to gain power? The power of our father, Sparta. Father? <laughs> I don't have a father. <laughs> I just don't like you, that's all. Narratively, this is why he loses his first battle against Virgil. In the most literal sense, Virgil is just more... motivated. Dante isn't fighting for anything here except just to throw down with his brother. Virgil will even frequently bring this up during the fight. Where's your motivation? It's at this point that Dante goes through a transformation, both literally and figuratively. He begins to understand the responsibility on his shoulders as the son of Sparta, and has his own awakening to justice. While helping Lady deal with her own family issues, Dante also learns the value of family, and sets off to stop Virgil from opening the underworld. Although Dante defeats him and claims the Force Edge, he was too late to save Virgil from plummeting into the underworld. Ultimately, Dante's recklessness cost him the only family he had left. Going from DMC3 to DMC1, we transition backwards from wacky Dante to cool Dante. Given DMC3's somewhat tragic ending, we can surmise that Dante decides to rein in his attitude a bit. He's still sarcastic and he still quips, but he takes his job as a devil hunter a bit more seriously as we can see from the trophies in his shop. Unfortunately, things don't quite work out for Dante here. By choosing to close himself off, he only ends up making himself more emotionally vulnerable you really get the sense that he is genuinely angry with Trish for her deception, despite the corny line. You have the face, but you'll never have her fire! Dante ends up so stubborn and focused on defeating Mundus that he doesn't even realize that Nilo Angelo is Virgil under Mundus's control, until it's too late and Dante fails to save his brother a second time. We also happen to learn in DMC5 the ultimate fate of Dante's mother, Ava. She sacrifices herself to save Dante and loses her life attempting to save Virgil. So when Trish takes a shot for Dante in this scene, this would retroactively be the second time Dante witnesses his mother giving her life to save him. From here, they start pushing Devils Never Cry as Dante's core development, which seems like a mistake in retrospect, but at least it explains what the hell happened to Dante in the animation and DMC2. Chronologically, the anime was made after DMC2, but features Dante from post-DMC1, and it sort of shows in how he's written. He's somehow even more somber and cold-shouldered than he was in 1. He rarely ever quips, and he just comes off as uncaring and unsympathetic to everyone around him. Not to mention the weird gimmicks they keep trying to push. Strawberry Sundays and this dumb coin thing he does. It's hard for me to gauge where Dante goes in these parts because neither story is specifically about him. Neither of the overarching plots are central to Dante or the lineage of Sparta, and he doesn't really need to develop or grow as a result. This is what I mean when I say that Devils Never Cry was kind of a mistake at this juncture because now he really has nowhere to grow. Fast forward to Devil May Cry 4, and Dante is back to his old, goofy self. Not sure what brought this along. Maybe spending time with Patty taught him to lighten up, 
Maybe giving the coin to Lucia was his way of deciding to stop pretending to be a hard ass. But in either case, he's literally been through hell and back, and it looks like Dante's finally allowed himself to be expressive and funny again. This works out nicely because he's passed on the angry stick to little baby Nero, whom he meets in DMC4 by sheer coincidence for the first time. It's unclear if Dante already knows about Nero being progeny of Sparta, the Devilbringer is kind of a big giveaway, but he almost naturally takes on a mentor role for Nero, as he ultimately entrusts Sparta's mission to the younger Devil Hunter. Maybe he sees a bit of himself in Nero's teen angst, maybe he's just content to know that the lineage of Sparta will live on, but Dante spends most of DMC4 in a good mood. He even decides to let Nero keep the Yamato, the last remnant of Virgil's memory, finally freeing Dante of his grief from so many years ago and knowing that his brother's legacy is in good hands. Well, then this happens. Imagine Dante's surprise when Kylo Ren steps into his office and tells him that Virgil is still alive and is trying to grow a giant demon space tree. After all these years, Dante's biggest failure comes back to haunt him, and he has one last chance to set things straight. V isn't even mincing words when he straight up refers to Virgil as Dante's reason for fighting, as though Dante has been fighting demons in Virgil's memory all this time. When he gets to the job, Dante's still a wisecracking show-off who still goofs around and makes a joke out of every big scary demon he runs into, but he's also adamant about making sure no one else gets involved in this fight. Not Trish, not Lady, and especially not Nero. It's not clear when Dante figured it out, but it might have been by the end of DMC4 when he realized that the Yamato naturally attuned to Nero, but Dante is aware that Virgil is Nero's father, and that Nero is out to kill him for taking his arm. Dante is so vehemently against Nero fighting Virgil, not just because of Dante's own personal vendetta, but because he doesn't want Nero killing his own father. Even when things are at their most dire against Urizen, Dante is making every effort to protect Nero from making the exact mistake he made. After all, it seems like almost everyone in Dante's life struggles with their parentage in one way or another. At first it seems like there's something fatalistic about Dante's mission. By the time Dante arrives at the Clyphoth tree, Virgil has already completely transformed into Urizen, consumed by his desire for power. And it seems that Dante is convinced there's no way back except to destroy him completely. It's a burden Dante is willing to take on himself, his last chance to save Virgil. Then V shows up, reunites Virgil with his humanity, and Dante gets a square off with Virgil the way it ought to be. Not hunter against monster, but brother against brother. Meanwhile, Nero finally learns the value of family the same way Dante did, and drops in to deliver this little bit. I'm putting a stop to this sibling rivalry. <laughs> no you're not. So to Nero's credit, maybe he does stop them from killing each other. Maybe Virgil finally learns that power isn't everything, and maybe he should stop opening gates to the underworld! And maybe Dante did need that little reminder about how much he should be valuing his family. In the end though, Dante entrusts the protection of the human world to Nero, for real this time, and he and Virgil go off to clean up his mess, the two brothers finally uniting to do what Sparta would have done. While Dante's ultimate fate is still uncertain, the last we see of him is in the underworld with Virgil, finally given a chance to make up for lost time the only way the brothers know how. But a design analysis of Dante wouldn't be complete if I didn't also talk about the worst written version of Dante ever. The Dante from Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. <laughs> So, Marvel Infinite's story is... bad. I could go on a whole video about it, but for now I won't. Dante in particular has some problems with how he's treated. Not that being badly written and horrifically out of character is exclusive to Dante, that's literally every character in the story. But Dante in particular feels like he was written by someone who has no idea who Dante is. 
For some reason, he is given a very specific role, and you can tell who the scriptwriters were trying to push as the story showcase characters based on how much screen time they get. And so, Dante was pigeonholed into the role of upstart loose cannon who can't be trusted, like he's the Star-Lord whose wild and uncontrollable temperament is gonna screw everything up because he can't play with the team, oh no. They may as well have given him the DMC2 coin flipping thing since he's just so uncommitted to the entire story. So it's supposed to come as this big surprise when Dante walks into the last scene and just hands the Soul Stone to Ultron Sigma like, oh no, did Dante's whimsical nature betray us at the last second? And it's just, it's stupid. Honestly, I just wanted to find an opportunity to share this line with you because it's awful and Ruben really tried his best. Oh, I see now. It's a lure. His powers intoxicating. I couldn't avoid this one, could I? Yes, this video would not at all be complete without talking about the 2013 DMC Devil May Cry reboot. Thanks to a large-scale effort to westernize their popular properties, Capcom reached out to UK-based developer Ninja Theory to re-envision the Devil May Cry franchise to appeal to a western audience. According to interviews, it was upon Capcom's insistence to make this new Dante as far away and vastly different from his previous incarnations. What followed was more than just an adaptation. It was an attempt to completely rebuild and rebrand the character of Dante as a whole. The internet has thankfully given us this laughably bad GDC presentation about what Dante is and isn't, which makes two things abundantly clear. One is that Ninja Theory obviously did not know what made classic Dante appealing, and two was that their desired aesthetic was grungy street Europunk. Now, I definitely won't be the first person you'll hear from that has a few words to say about Dino, but for reference, let's run down the checklist of everything wrong with him. Now, all things considered, the design they ended up with actually isn't horrible. Capcom was really pushing Ninja Theory to do something radically different, and based on some of this concept art, we're lucky with what we got. They were insistent on removing the white hair, a decision that will become a point of contention multiple times, but he's still wearing a big coat, and the red accents still read as Dante, so luckily they've hit two out of three visual signatures. Aside from the coat, he's just left with a wife beater, jeans, and grimy boots. Top with his punk shave, he looks slimy. He looks absolutely filthy. And I think in terms of intent, they've absolutely hit the nail on the head here. This here is a punk kid from the streets who starts fights everywhere he goes. He's not proper society and he doesn't care. He's a punk, a rebel. But is he Dante? No, of course he isn't. We can make that distinction now, but before DMC5, there was a very real possibility that this was the Dante we'd have from then on. One other thing I'd like to highlight is the design of Dino's guns. Ebony and Ivory this time around were given a more demonic twist, which does actually make the guns look unique. As neat as that is, I feel like it loses the distinctly human touch of classic Ebony and Ivory. The visual divide between ordinary guns and fantastic devil arms was what led Dante's arsenal also share his half-human, half-demon nature. But now all of Dino's guns have the same demonic twist. Even Revenant, his shotgun, has a sort of alien design to it. But then again, it's pointed out somewhere in the game that demon weapons appear in Limbo to be ordinary objects in the real world, like how the Kablooey is just a taser in the human world. Now I have to consider whether or not Ebony and Ivory are just ordinary pistols, or if Revenant is just an ordinary shotgun, or if Rebellion is just a baseball bat or something, and Dino fighting in Limbo is actually just him thrashing around the streets breaking things with a bat. The real dividing point, however, is Dino's personality. A lot of people remember Dino as being emo and annoying and whiny, but I can't even say he's any of those. He's too boring to be annoying. His line reads are flatter than a high school book report, whether or not he's having a serious moment or he's dropping quips. Okay, so to kill Mundus, we need to drag him away from the Hellgate. We do that by pissing him off. I just seem to drag on forever. Church. Hey, Bob. 
Put a spin on this. We are brothers, after all. Most of you are probably thinking of the infamous fuck you scene. Honestly, this is the only cutscene in the game where it feels like Dino's voice actually has some bark. And on a conceptual level, it's not even bad. Imagine being such a punk that you're talking to some millennium's old demon and you've made them so angry that all they can do is scream fuck you. That's some high tier trolling right there. That's actually funny. Unfortunately, this is the only scene in which Dino has any backbone. When you think about classic Dante, he's really the Will Smith of video game action heroes. He doesn't smoke, drink, curse excessively, or bang chicks to prove that he's a cool guy. He's just naturally charming and charismatic, and he can put his money where his mouth is because he's got smoking sick style. But within the first five minutes of DMC, Dino's getting wasted, smoking, banging two strippers in a trailer. They didn't want Dino to be a cool dude, they wanted Dino to be a bad dude. Now I'm not going to sit here and mark off how many ways Dino isn't like classic Dante because that's not the point. The point is how these elements don't necessarily do anything to flesh out the character. For all of Dino's substance abuse and indiscriminate sex, none of these ever hold him back or tempt him or compensate for any weakness of character he might have. He only has, like, one line of hesitation before he learns he's the son of Sparta and that he's a Nephilim. Then suddenly he's on board for the anarchy train. We never see a moment where Dino suffers from a relapse of drugs or that he's tempted by the prospect of Hanky Pank. The moment he puts on his hero boots, he's as straight edge as Virgil. And it's not the same as Dante waking up to justice in DMC3, because Dante in that game constantly screws up and his loss against Virgil forced him to confront his lineage and accept the responsibility on his shoulders. Dino is instead given this chick as his moral anchor, who ultimately has no chemistry with Dino and adds nothing to the story. When unprompted, Dino says to Mundus that he fights for freedom, but he used to live a lifestyle of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, which sounds like living free to me. If anything, it makes Dino feel disingenuous, something that'll become much more meaningful later. Nowadays, we look back and we laugh at that gay cowboy remark and how hilariously off the mark it was, but was Ninja Theory's Dino actually a 100% failure? In spite of everything that got wrong, they did manage to maintain at least one core theme of Dante's character. Rebellion. What makes this different from every other DMC is that rebellion, through the lens of grungy street Europunk, means rebellion against society, rebellion against authority, rebellion against the man. And to their credit, anti-establishmentism is a core part of punk rock culture, even if the game is exceedingly on the nose about it. Time for rebellion. However, at the same time, Ninja Theory director Tamim Antonidis was embracing a different kind of rebellion. Rebellion against the franchise. During pre-release interviews, Tamim had adopted this sort of punk rock persona, something he used to personally lash out against any criticism the game had attracted with its reveal. While there are plenty of lines that would easily make it to scrub quotes, the one in particular is the one where he points out that Fanboys are just angry that he doesn't have white hair anymore. And I'm going to focus on this one because of how many times it starts to contradict itself. I'm a million years. Antoinitis would then go on to continue belittling DMC fans for their outrage, insisting that their reboot was now the new hotness and that the classic games were old and busted. But for as bold as he was about staking his claim over the franchise, the game itself keeps doubling back on that declaration. There are various nods and references to the older games, like each achievement title being named after a classic DMC quote, which sort of shows a reverence for the series' legacy despite the rest of the game trying to spit on it. I'm a million years. But take a look what happens when Dino pops his devil trigger. <laughs> I'm a million years. 
it's not just some cute easter egg either. The story starts using white hair as the visual metaphor of Dino growing in power. A metaphor that retroactively ruins a different character entirely. Oh Virgil, they did you dirty. By the end of the game, Dino's hair is 50% white, as though the implication is that he'll eventually grow a full head of white hair and grow into the Dante that we remember. So when Dino says, I'm a million years, the game isn't even being honest. And that's what feels disingenuous about Dino. He's not even bold enough to be his own man without constantly anchoring himself to the Dante that people wanted. So everyone is instead just thinking about a Devil May Cry game they'd rather be playing instead of this one. Even though Dino succeeded in embodying that punk rock aesthetic, he failed to be the rebel he thought he was. Thankfully, he's passed on that punk stick to a character who needs it more. Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! So what was this extremely long and bad history lesson on Devil May Cry all about? Well, as I was piecing together the timeline of DMC, it all started to paint a picture for me. Whether intentional or not, Dante's history illustrates what it's like to experience adulthood. We were all teenagers once, and maybe some of you still are. Young, reckless, convinced that we've got everything figured out and we can take on the world. Until hubris brings us down to size and we lose something valuable. So as we become young adults, we start to close ourselves off. We start to loathe our younger selves for being so foolish. We start to focus on what we should be doing, even if we're only setting ourselves up to be hurt on the inside. And only after we've allowed ourselves to shed some tears, we look back and we rediscover what we've lost. We become ourselves again. And maybe, when the opportunity shows itself, we find the courage to face our past mistakes and bury the hatchet once and for all. Maybe I'm reading too far into a game series with lightning guitars, chainsaw motorcycle swords, and meteor hats, but I'm not asking anyone to start thinking about their life choices next time they hit up the bloody palace. But I do think it's profound that even a nigh-invulnerable superhuman woohoo party pizza man has something to teach us about life. And sometimes you just have to laugh at your demons and live your life going for that smoking sexy style. Devils never cry, but humans do, and that's okay. Boy, this design shop sure went places. I used to think of Devil May Cry as one of those game series that can get away with having basically no depth and being just about pure video game fun, but it's often the best characters who surprise me with their depth. Action heroes come and go, but Dante hits the jackpot. Let's get this party started. That's all for today's design shop. The algorithm demands that I ask you to leave a like and a comment, but don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications for more anime and game content from Trigger Punch. Our channel is supported on Patreon because it's impossible to profit from YouTube, so go ahead and check it out for exclusive early access at future videos. I'm ABI, and this has been one hell of a party.